I will awaken the dawn as my prayer ascends to you. So many people around our world at Easter time focus on the Easter bunny and hiding Easter eggs and eating chocolate bunnies. It is intended to be cute and fun for our little children. But to focus on this at Easter time can end up being very conflicting to our little children as they grow up to become adults. For example, when I was an associate pastor at a previous church, a man walked in my office and sat down. He began to tell me of the problems he was currently dealing with. I listened carefully. When he was finished, I began to share some sound financial stewardship advice with him, and I also shared the gospel with him. I immediately told him about Christ. He then immediately told me that he was a Christian, and he said it with firmness. And then it happened. As I was sharing about Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for us, I was talking about Easter. His eyebrows changed. He began to look somewhat confused or puzzled for a few seconds. Then he looked at me and asked me this question. So, Pastor, are you telling me that Easter is about Jesus Christ and not about the Easter Bunny? I could hardly believe that he had just asked me that question. This man looked to me to be about 40-something years of age. He said he'd been a Christian since he was a child, but he had never understood that Easter was not about the Easter Bunny, but about the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. How did this happen? Well, probably because Jesus was not made much of during the Easter season in his church or in churches that he may have grown up in. So in the Journey Church, our focus at Easter is totally on Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. That said, on our next slide, you'll see today's sermon title and passage, The Word of God Testifies About Jesus. The Word of God Testifies About Jesus. And we'll be in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. Please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1 and follow along with me very carefully beginning from verse 1. If you did not bring a Bible with you this morning, we have the passage up on the screens for you. And our passage today speaks to the authority of Scripture and to the authority and deity of Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, 1 through 18, I'll be reading to you out of the NASB version. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John, and it meant John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. 
the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. There is so much that testifies about Jesus Christ. First is the Bible. The Word of God itself testifies about Jesus, the Christ. In these 18 verses, the pronouns he, him, and his, meaning Jesus, the Christ, is mentioned 21 times. The word light meaning Jesus the Christ, is mentioned six times. The word, the word, capitalized W, meaning Jesus the Christ, is mentioned four times. The words Jesus Christ is mentioned once. So in all, Jesus is spoken of or mentioned a total of 32 times in just 18 verses. So calculate it out. If Jesus is mentioned here, 32 times in just 18 verses. How many times is Jesus mentioned all throughout the 21 chapters of the entire book of John? The book of John is all about Jesus. In fact, the entire Bible is all about Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Jesus. The entire Bible is His story. Jesus' story. Therefore, that is why our Easter sermon series will all be about His story. Our passage today from the book of John is very Christ-centered. Listen to this quote that is made by the editors of the NASB version about how they saw Jesus as they studied the original languages and did the editorial work on the book of John in the NASB version of the Bible. And I quote, What becomes increasingly clear as you read the Gospel of John is that Jesus does not fit the image of someone who is simply a nice moral teacher. Only a lunatic would make the claims he makes for himself unless he was who he said he was. John leaves no room for indecision. Like many people Jesus encounters in the book, As you read, you must either reject him or accept him. And then say in the end like Thomas, My Lord and my God. In John chapter 20, verse 28. This book is an incredibly powerful presentation of Jesus. End quote. On our next slide, you'll see a slide that shows the Greek word for the word is pronounced logos. Maybe you've seen that Greek word before, logos. This word, logos, also stands for the divine expression. The divine expression of God. What is the divine expression? The divine expression of God is Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, the Son of God. Jesus, this divine expression of God, who is the Word made flesh, came down from heaven and dwelt among us as men on this planet. On our next slide, you'll see the phrase that is so powerful in Scripture. In the Word of God, it says, the Word was made flesh. Isn't that amazing? The Word of God in heaven was made flesh. But what does it mean that the Word was made flesh? It means that the very Word of God, Jesus, the Christ, stepped out of eternity... And the pages of history out of the Bible, he actually came from heaven to earth and became real flesh. Jesus became a real man. Also, there is a well-known scripture that is especially important to emphasize here. Hebrews chapter 4, 12 through 14 out of the NASB. Verse 12, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword... And piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow. And able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, for the two verses that follow verse 12, you might not be as familiar with them. But watch what happens. Verse 13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. It doesn't say its sight as if we're talking about the Bible. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to him of the eyes of him of whom we have to do. 
In verse 13 here, the topic flows from the Word of God, the Bible, to the Word, Jesus Christ, and when it says the pronoun, His sight. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Now I want to show you something. This is what those three verses mean. Watch this. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare of him of whom we have to do. Therefore, since we have this great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. The word of God showed us who Jesus Christ is. He then left the heavens, passed through them, came down here to this earth, and became the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. On our next slide, you'll see just how long the Word of God will last. Have you ever thought about it? How long is God's Word going to last? Till maybe just the leather works off of the cover? Or, you know, is it just going to kind of disappear one day? Maybe people get tired of the Bible and maybe the Bible just totally disappears. Is that how it's going to happen? No. The Bible is going to last a long time. Let's look in Isaiah chapter 47 through 8. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass wither, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Okay, let's just put this in some point-blank statement imperatives. Grass withers and dies. Flowers fade and die. People, you and I, get old and die. But the word of God never dies. The Word of God, the Logos, Jesus Christ, never dies. On our next slide, you'll see a picture of a sign in a quadrangle. This sign is in the middle of my seminary campus. The three words written on this large sign is the centerpiece of our seminary campus. In three words, our faculty was teaching us that what we were to do as future preachers, teachers, missionaries, biblical counselors, and church leaders needed to be doing in our Christian ministries in the local church and community. Preach the word. And I was there a little bit longer than most students. Most of the students would get in and get their degrees within three years. Some would get their degrees in four years. You could actually get your THM or then follow through with a DMIN or a PhD. And you could get that in maybe five or six years. I was there ten and a half years. Four student bodies came through that seminary while I was there just getting my degree as I went. I was kind of like the story that you heard as you grew up about the tortoise and the hare. You remember the story about the tortoise and the hare? Who won the race? The tortoise did. You know what I started to see in the second, third, and fourth student bodies? People just trying to get degrees. Just hurrying up and getting out. And then they would base their reading on the fan method. You ever heard of the fan method? You know, yeah, I read the whole book 100%. You know, it's on the honesty policy. If you're going to seminary, you expect your ministers, your missionaries, your pastors, your preachers, your biblical counselors, your biblical leaders to be honest. Do you know how many people come back to not just my seminary, but other seminaries and say, I just feel guilty. I have to give back my degree. I did not read all of those books. And I said I did. They can't live with the guilt that they're incurring while they're in Christian ministry. But they said they read all of that material. Well, I was there for ten and a half years, and I saw that sign more than I can possibly tell you. Preach the word. Preach the word. Think about it. There is nothing else that will change a person spiritually, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, socially, and financially like the Word of God. The Word of God brings life change to a person's life. Therefore, I am not to preach to any congregation my thoughts or my beliefs or my desires or my hopes. I am to preach the Word. The Word of God The word of Christ. There are only two things that will last forever. Did you know that? There are only two things that will last forever. The word of God will last forever. 
We saw this in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 7 and 8. The Word of God is eternal. Why is it eternal? Because the God that spoke the Word of God is eternal. God's Word never comes to an end. This is why this verse of Scripture in Romans 10, 17 is so vitally important. Listen to Romans 10, 17 out of the NASB. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. Some other English versions will say, by the word of God. Do you know how you come to faith in the Lord? You come to faith in the Lord by hearing the word of God. By hearing the word of Christ. You cannot come to Christ and become a child of God, be born again, without hearing the truth of God's word. A lot of people want to say how they come to Christ sometimes, and they'll be sharing me their stories. If it didn't happen the way God said it happened, it didn't happen. God is not a liar. You need to stick to truth. You need to stick to what the Word of God said. It's living and active. You must read or hear the Word of God in order to be saved. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ or hearing by the Word of God, the Logos. Number two, a person's soul will last forever. My and your soul and the souls of every man, woman, and child will last forever. And not only will our souls last forever, the question is, where will our souls last forever? We all know that every person dies. So our souls will end up in one of two eternal places, heaven or hell. So the really important question becomes, where is your soul going to end up forever, heaven or hell? Have you ever heard the gospel? I am amazed at how many people I share the gospel with who have attended supposedly Christian churches of all denominations for years will tell me, no one's ever shared that with me, so I guess I'd have to say, no, I've never really heard the gospel. Well, let's start at the beginning and go to the end. It's very short. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He stepped out of heaven, came to this earth 2,000 years ago, died on a cross to pay for the penalty of mine and yours and all of mankind's sin. He was dead and buried in a tomb, dead for three days, according to the Scriptures, and raised to life, according to the Scriptures. And he was seen by over 514 people upon his resurrection. And then they saw him ascend, and he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. You either believe that, or you don't. Does it surprise you for you to hear that all of your life hinges on that? All of your life and where your soul will reside forever. How long is forever? Just kind of a little time, maybe a long time. Forever means forever. It never, ever, 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 ever ever ends the most important question you have to ask yourself is not where am I going to buy a house or where am I going to college who am I going to marry how many children will I have where will I attend church what neighborhood will I live in what will life be like when I get old will I have enough money to retire upon all of those are very important questions But you could spend your life trying diligently to answer all of those questions well. And then your fleeting life, when it's gone from here, is going to reside in hell. If you have not believed in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. On our last slide, you will see a Bible and a light. Let the Bible, the Word of God, light your way. Did you know that when you are being disobedient to the Word of God, that you're actually being disobedient to Jesus Christ Himself? You know how many people tell me all the time, oh, well, Pastor, you know, yeah, 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 I know what the Word of God says, but. No, but! There's really no need for me to go into a lot of pastoral counseling with somebody that's going to give me the phrase, I know what the Word of God says, but. 
what we need to start saying is, I know what the Word of God says. Praise God. I will do it. I bet that if Jesus Christ were to walk into the back of this sanctuary today, that we would all start living right in front of him. Amen? If Jesus Christ showed up in here in person today, I bet you we would just start acting a little differently. If he even went home with some of us after the worship service and lived with you in your home and went everywhere you went for two weeks, I bet you would change your words and your behavior. Why do we think that just because Jesus is not still here in the flesh that we can just live any way we please? The times when you and I are at our very best driving around town is when we see a police officer or a police car. Right? And once the police car is gone and out of sight, you sigh a sigh of relief and then you relax some and go back to your former ways of driving. I've seen it too many times on the freeway. People have their radar detectors. Why do they have the radar detector? They're trying to get around obeying the law. Jesus Christ intends for us to live holy, pure, and godly lives for him. It is absolutely astounding to me in the pastorate. The one thing I was shocked about when I went into the pastorate, and some 20 years now of dealing with people, is the amount of deep, deep, ungodly, unholy, unrighteous, filthy living of his people. It shocked me. I wasn't expecting it. Am I here to condemn you? No. Am I here to point you to Jesus Christ who you can ask for forgiveness and he will cleanse you and make you whole? Absolutely. But guys, we need to hear what the word of God says. And when the word of God speaks, we say, that's the word of God. Praise the Lord. I will obey it. Does God ever command any Christian anything in the scriptures that they cannot do? Never. And if you cannot do it, then the problem is not with the Word of God. The problem is not with the Father. The problem is not with the Son. The problem is not with the Spirit. One of the things that we have become very capable of doing in our generation is making excuses. Me included. We make excuses. Oh, but pastor, you don't understand. Well, if you, under, if you understood what circumstances I were under. What are you doing under there? God wants us to start obeying Him. And to start living for Him. Most Christians I know point fingers at the community. Look at what they're doing. Look at what they're doing. Oh, can you believe that? Can you? At the 5 o'clock news, the 10 o'clock news. Look at what. Can you? Can you believe that? We want to point fingers at all of them. And yet our lifestyle and our claiming to know Christ has no bearing on our personal lives. You know what's sometimes sad to me is that I see non-Christians living a better moral and godly life than somebody that really knows Christ. Don't you have some of those people in your life? They're not even Christians. They don't go to church. And yet you know inside they have something you wished you had. God forbid. They need to be looking at me and you and saying, I want what he has. I want what she has. What difference would it make to continue to come to church every Sunday, Sunday after Sunday? Let me tell you another little example. I've had families tell me this, a mom and a dad. You know, we've been to church all of our life. We get it. And the only reason we go now is so that we want our kids raised in the church so they'll get it. But we're good. We're not really here for us. We're only here so that our children can grow up and know God. When did we just get it? I'm a pastor and I still need to grow in Christ every single day. I confess my sins every day. I'm forgiven by the blood of Christ. The penalty for my sin has been covered and cleansed. But I still need to walk in fellowship with my Savior every day. So really, what should we do? We need to seek God first. But how? By believing the word of God. No more of saying, I know what the Bible says, but. If it says do something, do it. Don't make excuses for it. If you make excuses, you'll never obey Jesus. 
An excuse giver will never obey Jesus. How else do we seek God first? By studying the Word of God. How else do we seek God first? By applying the Word of God to our daily lives. How else do we seek God first? We take the Word of God and we share it with the people in our particular spheres of influence. There are people that you know that I don't know, that I don't associate with, that after you hearing the Word of God today, you need to take the Word of God and you need to take it to your spheres of influence. That's not called a church member. That's called a missionary. We think being a missionary means you've got to go to Africa and live in a mud hut. Every Christian is a missionary. You need to take the Word of God, allow the Word of God to transform your life, and then you take it out of here, and then you are a missionary to everybody around you. Immediate family, extended family, neighbors, friends, co-workers, people in restaurants, people at the gas pumps, wherever you go, hospitals, libraries, pools, parks, wherever you go, you're a missionary. All of this earth was not put here just for you to enjoy and not share the gospel. How much does the word of God really mean to us? How much does the word of God really mean to us? If it were not for God's mercy and grace and him translating it into our English language, we wouldn't know what it means to know God and follow God. But one of our profs down at DTS used to say that a dusty Bible leads to dirty lives. A dusty Bible leads to dirty lives. What are you going to do with the Word of God this week? What are you going to do to obey your Savior, the Word of God, Jesus Christ, the Logos, the divine expression of God? He is holy and He wants His children to be holy. Will you follow him? What if you say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus. Come down front during the invitation time. When they begin to sing, I'll lead you straight to Christ. I can't save you, but the Holy Spirit can. Do you want to know Jesus today? Do you want to make sure of where your soul resides? But what if you say, well, Pastor, I have been a Christian, but I've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. You can tell me that as well, and we'll set it up, and you can follow your Lord and be obedient to biblical, full immersion believer's baptism. If you say, Pastor... I know Jesus, I'm saved, I'm born again. And I have been biblically baptized, but I have yet to find a church home where I can worship God in spirit and grace and truth. And if you feel like this is where the Holy Spirit's leading you, then come forward and tell me that as well. But whatever you do, do something. Don't just be a spectator in church, be a participator in what God is doing. As they sing... See this as an invitation time you invited to spend time with God and respond as he leads. Let's stand.